Uh, we've got everything you need to know from the papers uh, in just a moment. Uh, and two great guests to take us through everything. This is Breakfast on GB News. It is 6.34, very nearly. This is Breakfast. Good morning to you. Now, there is a great picture on the front of the Daily Mail this morning. It's a look that says, I've just lost a lot of money again. Yeah, see if we can show it. Show me. There yeah, you go. Here we Look go. at that, Elon Musk. Yeah, Elon Musk. He's just lost two point five billion pounds. That rocket on that up. rocket. Yeah, it went up, and it very quickly came back down, didn't it? A rapid, unscheduled disassembly. They yes, that's it. the official. That's yes, the official. For blowing up. Yeah. Um, the Sun has got a lot on Paul O'Grady this morning. For the love of Paul, is the headline inside? Actually, there's a double page spread. Fans lining the streets to catch a glimpse of the funeral procession yesterday. And, and loads of dogs. And loads of dogs. It was lovely, wasn't it, really, mm. the, the pictures of that. Uh, and The Guardian, it splashes with the defiant-looking Dominic Raab outside number 10. That's the Justice Secretary's career. It hangs in the balance this morning as the Prime Minister decides his fate. Oh, and then a bit of delight in an Indian restaurant. Who doesn't like... Uh, going out for an Indian. A Ruby Absolutely. Murray. Oh, I love mm, a curry. Me too. Love a curry. The Prince of Wales uh, has delighted staff at an Indian restaurant during a visit to Birmingham as he accepted a customer's phone booking. Now, do you Did think you on the... What's yeah. that all about? Someone rang up to book a table and he, he, answered. he answered, hello, and took the booking. But do you think it's he said, cool. this is... Um, this is William. This is William here. I don't know. It's quite cool, though. Imagine isn't being it? that customer. That is quite customer. cool. I tell you what, Birmingham. I, mean, I, I do love a curry. Right, wherever you go, you can get decent curries. But in Birmingham, go for a Balti. Oh, now that. Yeah. I did that when I was a student, and I went to used to go to, over to Birmingham because I was in Nottingham. I used to go over to Birmingham, get a Balti, a big table naan, and all that stuff. Oh. Just the best food. Do you know what? Funny you say that. I had a curry in Birmingham. I think it was called Balti Bazaar. If that still yeah. exists, let me know. Wow, I think about it often. Yeah. And I've never been able to, to, to beat it, not since, not no. ever. I've even been to India and, and tried curries there, and it wasn't the same no. as the Balti. And that's impressive, because you talk about and think about food a An lot. An awful lot. You but honestly, I'm telling you, the best curry I've ever had was in Birmingham. I what was it called? I think it was Balti Bazaar. I might be wrong. Balti Bazaar. Balti Bazaar. If you're from Birmingham, let me know if yeah. that's a thing. But it was amazing, the best curry ever. And it was so cheap as well. It was like six pounds for a meal. Yeah. Fabulous. Love anyway, it. The best. Right, political commentator Benedict Spence is here with journalist Nabila Ramdani. Good morning, you two. Morning. Benedict, Good morning. let's kick off with the Telegraph, should we? There, I mean, it's quite a striking headline. Rob will <coughs> fight to the death to keep his job. That might be a little over-egging the pudding. I was going to say, just displaying the sort of aggression that I'm sure he's denying using whilst, whilst, yeah. whilst in office <laughs> against, against the allegations. I mean, it's fairly self-explanatory. This is... Uh, allies of the deputy, P deputy PM saying that the fact that Rishi Sunak hasn't come out yet uh, with his findings, it's not a clear opening uh, shut case, uh, shows that there are perhaps several layers to this story uh, that will come out in due course. Um, and the thing to remember about all of this is that there are many possible reasons why it's taking a bit of time. I know that you've touched upon a few of them uh, earlier on. Uh, but, you know, it, it's the there are very fact that, you know, it, it, it's citing allies of the, of the Deputy Prime Minister shows, you know, what, what we're talking about here. The Prime Minister doesn't actually have that large a majority. He doesn't actually have that much support, relatively. You know, he, he lost out the first time round that there was an election for him to become Prime Minister. He's not the most yeah, but popular. Not, but, but, well, he did, but not because of the MPs. He lost... No, true, but he doesn't so he doesn't have as much support as you might think. You know, you always need to remember with Tory party politics, there's a lot of backstabbing, there's a lot of ambition, even whilst the government is on the ropes and you think they all need to come together. It's actually very difficult to get Tory MPs to agree on lots of things. He needs his key allies in place to offer him that support. That's why they're there, by and large, not necessarily because they're brilliant at their job. Yeah, but if he gets hide, rid of... But it's a hide into nothing mm. if he holds on to Dominic Raab in the wake of a damaging report. Well, we don't know how damaging, and that's the thing. He's weighing but if up. It's, but if he's it's, weighing if it's up. not crystal... Mm. If he's not absolutely crystal clean mm. on this one, 
then that's bad news for the PM. This is a man whose job it is to take over as Prime Minister in case something happens to the Prime Minister. He's in charge of many different decisions, some of which are quite difficult. And the question that Rishi Sunak has to make is, is it worth getting rid of a key political ally uh, and a very senior politician in a government over what are potentially allegations that could get you into trouble at, say, a top company or somewhere else in the public sector, but at the top of government where it's a high-pressure environment, perhaps there needs to be some understanding that there is you know, more give and take when it comes to behaviour. I know that won't sound good, doesn't sound very popular, you know, optics and all that, but ultimately that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the running of the country, not an HR department somewhere about how people feel. And there will be the attitude from a lot of other Tory MPs, it must be said, if uh, they perceive it that Dominic Raab is being, you know, uh, hounded slightly for what they would consider just robust behaviour, that they might not be particularly happy, or other ministers in their positions might feel vulnerable to allegations of bullying themselves. That's what he's got to weigh up. He's got to weigh up sort of the pros and cons of saying, OK, he might have actually bullied somebody, but equally, he can't be seen to be getting rid of... This would be a third uh, uh, senior minister to, to have got rid of. And he's not really... Been, I don't think he's been in the job even for a year but yet. One of the indications that the situation is not clear-cut is Rishi, Rishi Sunak's decision to... He's effectively agonising over whether to keep Mm. Uh, um, 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 uh, Dominique Raab or not, and he clearly needs more time to review all these allegations. So, uh, it, you know, he's received a very lengthy report from Adam Tolley. Uh, uh, I was going to say QC, but it's KC now. Yes. Um, yeah. And so he's still undecided whether to, to keep him or not. Mm. But I have to say the whole thing is presented in a very strange way and you've got very different opinions about Dominique Raab um, uh, presented. But it... Um, Already you have critics calling for an independent judge to make a decision. They see... How hard can it be? Yeah, because I, I, I think it's because there's still a lot of anger over the former uh, Home Secretary, Priti Patel, who was clearly caught in a clear breach of the ministerial code, and Suella Braverman, who was also, you know, caught in, you know, uh, she, she behaved in a... Uh, she had serious disciplinary uh, issues, and yet she survived. So if Dominic Raab does survive as well then you can see the critics uh, coming, you know, uh, and, and saying, well, the whole system needs to be mm. reviewed because this is unsustainable. And also we could see if Dominic Raab is kept in post, is these civil servants are still in the department, these civil servants who've made these complaints, and if they feel like it's a whitewash, we could see mass resignations of, of civil servants now. But I we? think one of the problems that Dominic Raab has is we live in an age where, um, you know, also all sorts of allegations can lead to very serious co consequences. Mm. You know, how much of these allegations are very serious psychological abuse or, or indeed violence, psychological violence, or how much is it huffing and puffing to get things done? Mm. So that's, you know, a, a lot of things to, to be considered there. But as, um, uh, you know, as we were saying, it, it, you know, government should be run in a different way than HR departments. And... You know, it's all uh, almost that the, the culture that's coming from America, where you see the um, employment tribunals, where all sorts of actions or words can lead to huge settlements being paid. Now, bosses request to have uh, a wit witnesses to, to speak to members of staff, and it, it can, you know, it's it's that kind of culture that Dominic Raab mm. is being caught up in. There, mm. I say. Okay, let's have a look at the mail, Nabila. Um, there is concern that the uh, illegal immigration bill which obviously is a key part of the government's strategy and what Rishi yeah. Sunak wants to achieve, mm -hmm. um, could be blocked by the House of Lords. Yes, that's the front, a very strong front page uh, in the mail. An elected Lords plot to block the Rwanda flight uh, law and peers are poised to scup a vital bill that would stop judges halting deportations. So I think this story effectively sums up the eternal battle uh, between uh, the House of Lords and indeed the House of Commons uh, it's, in the end, the job of the House of Lords to keep uh, elected politicians in check. And uh, the Lords, you know, they see themselves as a watchdog of yeah. the Constitution, and this often puts them in conflict with elected MPs. Now, where this is uh, crucial for the government, it's because Rishi, Rishi Sunak, sorry, he's, he's clearly supporting his Home Secretary. He wants his showpiece legislation to, you know, his bill to go through. And uh, this is all part of, um, you know, of a strategy to win back voters. And uh, what a better way to do this than uh, finally dealing with a contentious issue, which is, uh, 
illegal immigration. It could, I mean, look, this would be problematic if the Lords block it. But there's always a Parliament Act, Benedict. Mm. That's a, I, I think a lot of this is sort of a show. Because that, that would bypass. Exactly, it is for show. But it is also, I think, because Rishi Sunak is acutely aware of the lack of time that he has. You know, it, th this would not necessarily prevent him from being able to pass legislation, but it could slow it down. And given that he's already pledged to sort of stop the boats, um, I wasn't sure if he, he pledged to do it by the end of the year. I think he tried to row back on that later but no, nonetheless he has made that part of the you know one of the cornerstones of his premiership mm. is that he will address this and if you have it being bogged down in the lords as well as the legal challenges that it will almost certainly face um, and apart, quite apart from the fact that it is a very contentious issue it means that you're sort of we're already at, towards the end of april you're creeping into the middle of the year and no progress has necessarily been made in this and of course the legislation needs to be passed before he can then take action by which point you will have already had many thousands of people already coming across the channel. So I think it's a, it's a bit of a sort of a PR game. It's, it's sort of a bit of a threat to the Lord saying, you know, don't test us on this. You know, we're, we're prepared to you know, fight you on it um, because he knows that he will get pushed back. But it is all, of course, because he doesn't have the best polling ratings. We don't have that long until, you know, the, the end of the year. And that will signal the start of the next election cycle, at which point people will start to look at his record. And the question will be, was he decisive or was he bogged down by special interests elsewhere? Mm. But the thing is, the Lords are not the only challenge to this immigration bill, because we have seen the uh, European Court of Human Rights also weighing in. And a lot of people think that the measures of the illegal immigration bill are actually illegal themselves, and they are bound to fail if the European Court weighs in. So a bill which is meant to deal with illegal immigration is deemed illegal itself by a, a European Court. And remember that Britain leaving the EU doesn't mean that uh, the European Court of, uh, of Human Rights doesn't have jurisdiction in, in Britain anymore. It still does. No, but we could ignore it. Yes, but uh, it, it, it's hard to uh, ignore when a case is presented about human rights and protecting, you know, um, making... Uh, so some of the uh, immigrants are, have uh, um, very valid uh, cases, mm. but the... the, the, the I think the problem is that the debate is all bundled up with illegal immigrants as opposed to, you know, people who have rights to come in. But in any case, uh, Rishi Sunak wants to present himself, as Benedict says, as the man who will be able to stop the small uh, boats coming in. Mm. But the reality is uh, thousands of people are still coming in, mm. over, even though it's less reported. You know, I've been covering uh, this kind of story from the, the so-called jungle in Calais. Uh, you know, it's been gone for decades. The jungle has been dismantled in 2016. But these stories about illegal immigrants coming have been going for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And yet, yeah. the Tories will still be perceived as the party who failed to yeah. stop them. Well, now it's the sophistication of the human trafficking gangs, isn't it? It's, it's mm. just something that just evolves over time, it seems, very sadly. Uh, Benedict, let's go to you, shall we, in the story in The Times um, about the sleeping pills warding off Alzheimer's. Yes, so mm. this is... It's a drug called uh, Suvorexant, which is used to treat insomnia, and that's been found to reduce by 10 to 20% the build-up of certain plaques in the brain. Uh, that are a key cause of Alzheimer's disease. And I think that it's, it is very interesting because very often, actually, you know, a lot of uh, progress in medicine is through sort of trial and error with drugs that already exist and then are found to have sort of knock-on effects for other things. And it's curious because uh, we've made a lot of progress in things like cancer, things like heart disease in the last few years. You know, we haven't cured these things, but we have definitely made progress. Alzheimer's, you know, dementia, it's the big thing, actually, that's sort of hanging over a lot of people is that as we get older, more people become more prone to developing it. And, of course, it's not a quick killer. It's a very slow, very traumatic, debilitating thing, and it costs a lot of money. So this is a specific sleeping pill, not your... Uh, not this your, is, well, this is... That's, sleeping aid. Yeah, this is the one that has been used in this trial in the US, um, and it's already been approved um, across the world for insomnia, and it's been found to have this effect. Now, that's yeah. not to say that it cures Alzheimer's. It no, simply stops the build-up of plaques, but it is the start, perhaps, of a process to finding a cure. Yeah, there are lots of things that actually they are linked so to it. People say fasting can help. People say, you know, oh, there are lots of different things that could potentially, potentially help you not develop it. Uh, we're not at a stage yet where we have a cure, but given how much it costs to keep people with Alzheimer's, let alone treat them, I think this has to be sort of the next big frontier it's gonna in, help. in medicine. It's going to help, but don't go popping those sleep oh, aids over no. the counter. <laughs> I tell you what, they make me feel so drowsy for 24 hours. 
<laughs> get a good sleep, but I'm like a yeah. zombie. Might actually. stop you getting Alzheimer's, but if you're asleep for half the day, actually, what's the point? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Benedict and Nabila, we've got to leave it there. Good to see you this morning. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much indeed. Morning, 7.41. This is Breakfast, whether you're watching us on the TV, online, on listening on the radio. Great to have you with us this morning. Now, there's a great picture on the front of the Daily Mail this morning, and it's a look that says, I've just lost a lot of money. Again, it's Elon Musk. He's just lost £2.5 billion pounds. It's after his rocket exploded, should we say, about four minutes into taking off. Yeah, but the mission was a success. Apparently. Because of what they've learned from it. That's the thing. Um, the Sun's going on Paul O'Grady. Uh, it's a big picture story. Um, there's a picture of the sort of, um, what would you call it, horse and carriage mm. sort of thing, um, with uh, his husband uh, sat there with uh, one of their dogs. Um, and there's, it's full. There's a double, big double page spread inside of, of people at Paul O'Grady's funeral. So many people want to come out and market. Mm. Loads of dogs coming out as well. Oh, it must have been such an amazing sight, especially for his husband, just to see the outpouring of love for Paul O'Grady. Mm. Amazing. The Guardian splashes with a very defiant-looking Dominic Raab outside number 10. The Justice Secretary's career hangs in the balance this morning as the Prime Minister decides his fate. And who doesn't like um, a curry? Let's be honest, most of us love a curry. It's a national dish, isn't it? A korma. Yeah, Chicken yeah. Korma. Uh, can you imagine ringing up your local and say, oh, can I have a table for uh, 7 o'clock on Saturday? And the phone's answered by the Prince of Wales, uh, which is what happened, believe it or not. Um, that was in Birmingham, uh, where uh, William delighted staff at a restaurant there because he uh, took a customer's phone book in. Can you imagine that, ringing up to book a curry? Hello, it's the Prince of Wales. When would you like your table? Uh, you'd you'd, you'd be delighted. You'd leave a tip for that, wouldn't you? You would, you would. And apparently they were they went down an absolute treat, the Prince and Princess of Wales. I hope they took Birmingham the loved them. I hope they had an arm bread and an onion bargy. Oh, I always I... have I always have onion barges to start yeah, every me too. time. Me too. Oh, and the is it the mango chocolate? Or the mango dip thing. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there Very you go, good. you see. Yeah. That we're we're digressing bird, into food again. What we like? I know, you Classy bird, I know. Yeah. Now, we are joined by journalist and political commentator Benedict Spence and journalist and broadcaster Nabila Ramdani to go through the papers with us this morning. Uh, round two. Uh, Nabila, let's have a look at uh, the Metro, shall we? And Elon, we have a problem. Yes, indeed. I mean, some of the headlines uh, you know, on this story are superb, but not least of all the Metro, yeah. which is Elon, we have a problem. Sorry for the terrible American accent, yeah. but it's clearly a line from the um, uh, Apollo 13 mission, yes. uh, one of uh, NASA's big uh, missions meant to land on, on the moon, and Tom Hanks, you know, plays in the movie, and he delivers that line. And indeed, Elon did have a very big problem indeed, because Effectively, he um, spent 2.5 uh, billion on, on this rocket, which blew up after only four minutes being launched. Mm. Now, the phrase to blow up money couldn't make any more uh, sense. Well, yeah. But isn't it interesting? We look, we look at it as a, as a disaster. But it, in reality, it's not. Well, it, it is. I mean, it's, one, it's the biggest well, ever built. You know, uh, but they I got mean, it off. The, it's the biggest ever built by a long way, and they got it off the ground. Well, that's, the that's key. they claim to mitigate how disastrous it was. They said no, no, the, but the very really, fact but, that it launched was a success but, in itself. But, but it, I'm but not it buying is. this. No, no, that's absolutely right. It's, if you look at all the um, <laughs> look at all the boosters now. I mean, he's, the the other SpaceX ships where they go up and then all the booster rockets come down and land on the and the main thing mm. comes and lands on the pad. All of that was unheard of unimaginable just a few years ago. And it took lots and lots of efforts for those boosters to come out. They were all collapsed. They blew well, up I, I... This is, this is how you learn. Yeah. Well, this is what Musk tweeted himself. He said, congrats, SpaceX team, on an exciting test launch of Starship. Learned a lot for the next X launch in, an, in the next few months. Now, I can't remember stuff like this happening to the Starship Enterprise, can you? I mean, well, well I mean, no. There's nothing exciting that's, about any of that. That's this. not real, though. <laughs> I hate to tell you. 
That's the 24th century. I can remember <laughs> it happening yeah. in Star Wars, though. It <laughs> happened a lot. Things blew up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to balance it out. But I, I, I think... I think he's very ambitious. I think his aim is to ultimately colonise Mars. Yeah. I think, no, no, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think Stephen's right. It's, it's like people telling Philip of Spain you're wasting a lot of money sending ships trying to find the new world. You know, it, it might have cost a little bit in the short term, but long term it paid off. Um, yeah, we are talking about, as you say, it's, it's reusable rockets, rockets that can actually land, that can refuel if they do reach um, uh, the moon or Mars, and that are going to be taking crews of between 40 and 100 people eventually. You want it to be blowing up before it gets to the stage of putting yeah. people on it. Um, you know, it, it was significantly larger than anything else we've ever tried oh, to yeah. launch into space. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's trial and error, it's, it's testing. I'm quite excited by it. You know, I'm yeah. quite happy that it's not taxpayers paying for it, if nothing else. Then oh, it's yeah. one man spending his own money. If he wants to do that, fine. I mean, it would but have been it, nice if it had worked. It would have been nice but, if it's worked. You know, but eventually, I hope, it will work. It will. You know, eventually, you'll get it right. Um, yeah. And as I say, it didn't have people on it. So that's the key thing. It wasn't, yeah. you know, we're, we're better off blowing them up at this stage rather than when, when even, you know, when we, when we actually have manned space, space missions going. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I yeah. still think it's hard to put a positive spin on it, <laughs> especially when you have the ego of Elon Musk. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, for, what, for once, I disagree with you, Nabila, on that one. <laughs> I do, I do. Um, what about talking of cash? Yeah, yeah. Lots of it. <laughs> Two and a half billion is nothing to the NHS, of course. Yes. Uh, how many in, hours the is in the Times, um, Benedict, um, Labour is Labour. Mm. Have said money isn't the cure for the NHS. I think that this is an important uh, moment. This really. is significant, this is, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, Wes Streeting saying that actually reform will take precedency. He says it will do most of the heavy lifting under a Labour government. Of course, he's sticking the boot in a little bit to the Tories, saying we expect the cupboard to be bare. When we, get, when we get into power, we don't expect there to be any money. But he's saying that it'll have to be more to do with shifting resources to things like GPs and local care rather than just throwing money at emergency services. He cites the King's Fund report, uh, which says that the problem is far too much money is being thrown at the NHS into the wrong places at the last minute to try to patch up things that are already broken. Um, you know, he, he says in, he gave a speech to the King's Fund think tank and he says, I'm not going to pretend that the NHS is the envy of the world anymore. I'm not going to trot out those lines mm. because it isn't and patients know that it isn't. Um, and there are other stories actually on this page of the Times about uh, doctors pay, about nurses going on strike. And I think that sort of reflects the whole situation. It's, these strikes haven't actually affected people as much, I think, as people were expecting, or certainly the media were expecting, and potentially not as much as the people going on strike were expecting, because a lot of people no longer anticipate the system to work as it should. They don't expect to be seen by a doctor within a certain amount of time. So that's already the case. And then you've got doctors or nurses asking for 20 30% pay rises. I think the public attitude then does become, actually, what is this money going to pay for if it's only going to be propping up a, si a situation that already doesn't work? So I think it is clever... Uh, from Labour, and also, frankly, it's overdue mm. that they shift the response from the NHS is being underfunded and the Tories want to privatise it to, guys, the system isn't fit for purpose anymore. We are going to have to change how we actually use it. Mm. It is significant from Labour, isn't it, to say they're not just going to throw money at the, at the problem anymore. Mm. This is reform, and yeah. we don't know yet what, what form that will that will take, whether it's root and branch mm. or whether, you know, it's going to obviously going to take a very long time. But the, the point is, it probably does need to happen under yeah. a Labour government, doesn't it? it needs, because the polls yes. suggest the Conservatives just aren't trusted. They aren't Labour. trusted. And, you, know, you can just take a look at the state of the NHS to see why they aren't trusted. But you know, it shows a maturity. It's in, you know, Wes Streeting taking the lead on this, Keir Starmer being very... You know, he is good at this, actually. You know, he, he knows his own weaknesses and he knows he has to portray a government in waiting rather than just a prime minister in waiting. Yeah. So, actually, that's key, I think. Here. We, we've got to leave it there, sadly. Benedict Nabila, thank you both very much indeed. We'll see you uh, in the next hour. <music> 8.40, good morning. TV chef Kevin Woodford mm. has, been in, has been in touch. Oh, yeah. He likes a cup of tea. Uh, he likes red bush tea with um, a fig biscuit, or a fig roll, Ooh. I presume. Okay. Dumped in his tea. I see. I do like a fig roll. No. I haven't had one for a long time. I do like a fig roll. Yeah, old you know, school. I it is old say. school. Uh, not my choice. No, I'm going to be real oh. with you on the red bush or the fig roll. But each to yeah. our own, Kevin. Each to our own. See, if Kevin, if Kevin says it, it's true. Basically. He's a chef. He does know his stuff. He knows his he? stuff. Best scrambled eggs in the business. Oh really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing, oh, that's scra awesome. amazing scrambled eggs, Kevin does.
That's also a very difficult thing to achieve, I think, a scrambled egg, but that's a whole other situation that we won't Is get it? into this morning. Well, you're yes. quite good in the kitchen. I'm very good at the kitchen, but very difficult to achieve outside of, of your own kitchen. Oh. If you order scrambled eggs out, they always come, you know, like a microwave. Oh, oh I know. It's a whole other thing. Uh, away um, from food, but let's show you. Oh, well, go can on. I just say, do go let on. us know what, what your favourite biscuit is with tea, please, because yeah. that was good. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, there is a fantastic picture on the front of the Daily Mail this morning. Um, Elon Musk and that look that says, I've just lost two and a half billion pounds after Starship blew up again. But the mission has been a success. Yeah. It blew up, but they're calling that a rapid, unscheduled disassembly. Hmm. That's how they put it. And he is still smiling. He is Rye still smiling. smile, it must yeah. be said. Uh, inside the sun is a, a picture story, a, a very powerful one, of fans lining the streets to catch a glimpse of Paul O'Grady's funeral procession. You can see... If you are listening on the radio, on the front page there, his husband sitting on top of that, would you call it a horse and carriage? Yes. Holding the couple's dog, really powerful image there. I mean, so sad, but it was, uh, do you know what, what a beautiful tribute that so many people came out and came out with their dogs, mm. actually, just to say thank you. I think that's really nice, mm. nice thing to do. Um, not such a great picture for Dominic Raab on the front of The Guardian this morning, looking defiant, coming outside number 10. His career hangs in the balance, of course. The Prime Minister is deciding, deciding his fate as we speak. And this one is a great story. This is in the mirror. The Prince of Wales delights staff at an Indian restaurant during a visit to Birmingham. And he even picks up the phone and answers a customer's booking. Can you imagine being that customer? Ringing mm. up, getting a table for 7 o'clock on Saturday night. And it's the Prince of Wales answering the, answering the phone. Love Hello, it. how can I help you? Look how happy they look, though. They're all laughing their heads off, oh. which is lovely. I like that. Natural, now normal. I, now, I believe that is their first public outing since Spare was published, the first, you know, out and about meeting. Is it? Apparently, um, we, I may not oh. be correct on that, I'll ask Cameron Walker, our royal reporter. Um, and they received such a warm reception, yeah. as they would, and they are brilliant. I like them Really lot. good to see them back out and again, smiling doing what they do best, which yeah. is with the public, being normal, like you say. Yeah, yeah, good on them. Lovely. Um, now, political commentator Benedict Spence is here with journalist Nabila Ramdani to take us through the papers this morning. Let's have a quick look. We'll rattle through some of these. Benedict in The Times, we've talked about it a lot this morning, but um, yep. Dominic Raab yeah. standing firm. Yep, it's on a lot of the front pages, The Times, The Guardian, The Telegraph, um, as you've touched upon. Rishi Sunak, according to The Times, is agonising over what The Guardian calls a stinging report about Dominic Raab. And, you know, there are many sort of different reasons why it could be that this is taking a little bit of time. Um, obviously, that's not very Dithering. Us. Yes, dithering. Is it is it weakness on the part of Rishi Sunak? Is it because he just wants to be thorough, spreadsheet Rishi, as they call him, trying to, you know, be across all of the details, not wanting to make the wrong mistake? Is it because Dominic Raab has a lot of sway with a lot of backbenchers who uh, Sunak needs unsigned? We don't know. All that we do know is the longer that this drags on and it becomes more of a story, then it does, I'm afraid, make Starmer, uh, Starmer, sorry, Sunak, <laughs> look, look a that, that little bit weaker, you know. But he's already lost a number of uh, front bench uh, uh, ministers since he's become prime minister. So either way, you know, as they say, it's, it's not a good look. Whether or not that actually sort of feeds through into public perception, I'm not sure. Everybody understands being a minister is a very important job, very tough job. But still, I think a decision probably needs to be made today preferably before lunchtime. Yeah, well, um, yeah. Otherwise, I think it is becoming, as they call it, a saga. And I don't think pr Prime Ministers really want sagas about bullying in no. their own governments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We could do without that, couldn't we? Uh, Nabila, let's go to a totally different story now. I want to mm -hmm. jump down the list to uh, what is on the front page of the Star today is, of course, Paul O'Grady's funeral procession, really powerful images of lots of people coming out with their dogs. Actually, yes. So to pay uh, tribute. Goes with the title, The Love of Dogs, and, you know, dozens of dogs lined up the streets when Paul O'Grady, you know, was put to rest and um, in Kent yesterday. A lot of celebrities turned up, but a lot of the emphasis was on, on the dogs. Uh, you know, faithful friends uh, say farewell to, to TV's um, uh, Paul O'Grady. It's, it's very hard, you know, to discuss this story with a dry eye because mm. of what kind of person Paul O'Grady was. He was not only a wonderful entertainer, but he was also a very decent uh, person. And uh, not only there was a lot of A-list celebrities at his funerals, including um, Ronnie Woods from, from the Rolling Stones, but it was particularly moving to see all those dogs from Battersea, Dog's Home, 
And there was a lovely lady from uh, Battersea uh, who said that Paul was not just a man of the people, he was a man of the people and their pets. Mm. And I think it said it all, really. And, and she also said that the heart of Battersea Docks Home, which is probably the most famous in the world, mm. has slowed down a little because of Paul's passing. You, you can't get more moving than that. Really. No. But look, it's funny, isn't it, just to be such an, a national treasure in, mm. in the way that, that he was to so many people's lives. Mm. It's amazing. Um, Benedict, to The Telegraph. I don't know what to make of this one. Um, a farmer has tried to protect a village from flooding mm. by bulldozing a beauty spot. Yes. So he's been sent to jail. For 12 months, for a year. And, it's, and he's been fined... Uh, well, he's been told to pay £600,000 in costs. Um, uh, this is... I think this is something that will strike at the heart of a lot of people because the reason why... Uh, this man has been sent to jail. It, it's for uh, dredging a river, for altering the course of a river and cutting down some trees. And the reason why he did it, he says, is because the river was regularly flooding some local houses. Um, and the environment agency, the local authorities, weren't dredging it. They weren't doing anything to stop it. Local people, other people in the village uh, uh, whose houses were being flooded, uh, have said that they were in favour of him doing what he was doing. But it was a protected area. There were endangered species, supposedly, uh, in that part of the river. It's a tricky one because this is what happens ultimately when you have so much bureaucracy and so much sort of obstinacy at a local level over things that, let's be honest, are important, but a lack of movement prompts people to take matters into their own hands. If yeah. people's houses are being flooded, you can only expect them to put up with that for so long. So long. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, but as we see, people then take action, they, they take the law into their own hands, and this can be repeated across almost sort of any number of sectors where you could see people taking the law into their own hands if local authorities don't act. And, you know, this is one of the issues that we have around things like policing in this country. You know, if, if police don't turn up to burglaries and stuff, how long is it before people start to confront burglars and that sort of thing? It is something that the state needs to be on top of. You can't just sort of sit behind the protection of red tape and bureaucracy and say, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, and then watch people's lives potentially be destroyed because their houses are being flooded and expect them not to do anything. So I'm I not, think this does uh, yeah. resonate with all It's people. difficult. I'm not, I'm not saying this farmer is right, mm. but certainly don't think he should have gone to jail. It's a lot of money and a lot of time for what he's done, frankly, and I think it's more punitive than it needed to be frankly, yeah. in the grand scheme of things. Mm. Yeah, surely the environment agency could have... Got, why didn't they re, you know, remodel the river and get, a, get on and sort it out? Mm. It's what they're supposed to mm. do, but famously we're quite bad at dredging. <sighs> um, we have floods yes. every year in this country because of that lack of action, because of enviro environmental mm. protection, so yeah. and it's uh, a recurring story. Yeah, and questions about planning. I mean, if that is an area that floods yearly, mm. why were their houses there in the first place? Certainly the point mm. is that you, you will have a view on that story. Yeah. GBviews at gbnews.uk. Um, we are out of time. It's been really good to see you, Benedict, Nabila. Thank, thank you both very much indeed.